Aloha, and welcome back to the fourth episode of Talk Story with House Majority. My name is Della Albalati, and I serve as the House Majority Leader for the State of Hawaii's 30th Legislature. This mm-hmm. weekly webcast is comprised of conversations with state executives, community and business leaders, and my Democratic colleagues in the House of Representatives. I'm very excited about this episode today. We are in week 10 of the state stay-at-home orders, and the legislature just finished a two-week session. The theme of this week's episode is leadership in the time of crisis and consensus building. I have two very special guests with me today. First off, I will be joined by Governor David Ige, who is at the forefront of our state's response in these times of uncertainty. Later, I will be speaking with Speaker of the House Scott Psyche about this behind-the-scenes work of dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic. Be sure to comment with your questions to our guest in the live stream featured on facebook.com backslash Olelo community. So today I have joining me uh, Governor David Ige. Welcome, Governor, to, to our show today. Well, thank you so much, Della, for having me on. I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and for those uh, watching all across the state of Hawaii. Thank you so much, Governor. You know, this is a little bit different. We really want to kind of delve a little bit beyond just the, the you know, the, the highlights that are that are on, on our newspapers. Really want this conversation to be about leadership. And so 10, 15 years from now, after we've successfully navigated this pandemic, which I believe we really are going to do together, uh, my first question to you is, what would you like people to say about your leadership? You know, I think, Della, the most important um, thing is that um, we can only be successful as a community. Uh, you know, what the what COVID-19 uh, taught us is that uh, if we um, are taking uh, independent and disparate kind of actions, uh, we cannot be successful. And I think you've seen it uh, on CNN and all across the country where um, you know, the, the governor disagrees with the legislature, uh, disagrees with county mayors, uh, and you can kind of see the uneven um, actions. And I think um, most um, of most concern really is, is the fact that the, the community suffers. Uh, so certainly um, I hope that those who um, study COVID-19 and, and this pandemic uh, 20 years from now will really look uh, and see that uh, we did come together as a community uh, to fight the battle together, and we uh, were successful because of that. You know, I think that's something really unique to Hawaii, to uh, to our community. I don't want to um, overshadow or uh, uh, that, that we don't have difficulties because I think you've seen that. And, and I'll be the first to acknowledge the relationship between the legislature, the executive has, hasn't always been smooth, but I think we always keep coming back to the table and that's really important. So for me, you know, educating a legislator, you know, when you are confronted with tough decisions as the executive, and it, it's very clear that others are looking to you to make the final call, what are the conditions, the quality of the information, who are the people that you are looking to that will make you eventually make that ultimate call when it's called upon you to do that? You know, a couple of things, Della, Mm -hmm. and obviously um, for me on the executive side, uh, the cabinet is very important. And I've really looked for leaders in the cabinet uh, and tried to get a balance of different backgrounds and experiences. Uh, But I really worked very hard to empower the cabinet members to really do their job, to to have the authority. Uh, You know, obviously, there are some big decisions that need to be made, uh, and I need to be directly involved. But really, I challenge each and every one of them to do their best on behalf of the people. Uh, And I think that that's really important. Uh, I do appreciate the support and the collaboration with um, the House and Speaker Psyche, Chair Luke and yourself have been very uh, supportive. Yeah, I know it's uh, been a challenge with unemployment insurance and a whole bunch of other things. And I really do appreciate that the House has really committed to putting the community first and uh, really being willing to, um, you know, 
talk about the real tough policy issues, but uh, been willing to allow me to make the decisions that I think best serve our community, uh, and then have been able to uh, support those uh, decisions. So, yeah, I just really appreciate uh, everything that uh, Speaker Psyche, um, Chair Luke, and yourself have done uh, to really serve the community. Thank, thank you, Governor Ike, for that. I, I want to, before I leave the notion of your cabinet, because I think being a cabinet member must be so interesting, and you must hear different points of view that are sometimes in conflict, in, in direct conflict, and one person's pulling you this way and one person's pulling th you this way. How do you deal with the different agendas, sometimes the conflicting information? And, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of egos. You must have a lot of egos in your administration, and you just can't. Like, we have egos in the legislature. How do you deal with all of that conflict? I do appreciate uh, each and every cabinet members. And yes, they, they do have egos. But, you know, I really stress with uh, everybody that it's really about uh, serving the public and uh, and really doing what's um, in the best interest of the people. I mean, you you know, when we look at um, this uh, pandemic response and clearly, you know, Bruce Anderson and Sarah Park have been criticized in the public, but they really... Uh, have been focused on what makes um, the most sense in protecting the public health, you know, and um, Claire Connors as attorney general has really um, been challenged to, to answer the legal issues and make sure that we can navigate. Um, clearly, we're in an emergency situation, so the, the executive does have uh, more authority to, to, to take action. Um, but it's always about trying to balance, you know, the long-term outcome and making sure that we can um, exit out in a way that uh, serves the community. Uh, you know, and then General Hara, um, you know, as uh, director of Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, you know, he's really interfacing with the federal government, you know, trying to uh, manage the National Guard and make mm -hmm. sure that we can get the resources we need, uh, you know, and really working with um, um, uh, everybody involved to, to come to a decision that we need to support as a, a community and move forward. And thank you, Governor, for asking these questions, because I think, you know, the, the public sees the conflict and we don't understand it. But I think that is very much a part of the a good decision making process, the fact that you're getting informed by lots of different folks. So going to the next question, you know, your leadership style has been attributed to your background as an engineer. My background is as a high school social study teacher. I love all these conversations about government. On the positive side, um, your background as an engineer means that you're methodical, you're analytical. Um, on the more critical side, you know, some would suggest that this might lead to analysis paralysis. So what would you say to your detractors about this criticism? You know, I've heard that a lot, um, Della, and I, you know, I challenge people when they bring it up that, you know, I have been criticized as so slow to respond. And, you know, I'm willing to talk about that directly. You know, I... I really focus on what's in the best interest of the community. Uh, and it is about um, making decisions that um, you won't have any regrets, um, you know, going forward. Uh, clearly, at the initial stages of uh, this pandemic, the focus uh, was uh, on the public health, really, and, and taking the actions that, um, that the experts are suggesting uh, is critical to flatten the curve and, and really um, keep our community safe. Uh, and that a lot of those decisions early on, uh, you know, I knew that the 14-day mandatory quarantine would uh, wreak havoc in our community. Uh, and clearly that was a tough decision to make. Um, you know, from the public health perspective, we knew that that would be the only way uh, to really um, clamp down on um, the virus infection here in the state. Uh, but also, I knew that that would lead to unemployment numbers that we've never seen uh, before, uh, really in the entire history of the state of Hawaii. Um, and so um, recognize that there'd be severe economic impact and, and knowing that we just needed to do it um, because uh, otherwise there would be putting lives and our community at risk. 
you know, Governor, since you mentioned that 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 fourteen day quarantine, you know, you've gotten a lot of flack from it. I didn't really think of that as we as you know, as the legislature was pushing and pushing you to close down. But really, that fourteen day quarantine, and for all of the holes that have been poked at the enforcement, that really is the policy. And that I want to sh- give a shout out to you. That was your policy call to impose that fourteen day quarantine and then have your AG's office really enforce it. And that, that's not happening in any other state. I don't think that the public understands that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. You know, um, Della, I am on a call with all the nation's governors and territories. So typically there are 50 governors uh, on the call and we talk about it um, all the time. 22, 22 states have ordered mandatory quarantines of, you know, some uh, quarantine, those coming from New York, you know, different ways of trying to um, isolate uh, and stay away from those communities with uh, a lot of virus activity. Hawaii is the only state in the country that the quarantine actually means something. You know, we were serious about enforcing it. You know, we um, have identified the gaps in the process, and obviously there are, you know, people who just want to uh, circumvent and ignore the law. Um, but, you know, the overwhelming um, majority of people who are ordered to quarantine are fulfilling that requirement. And we've been working with the counties uh, across the state, um, working with the legislature as we've identified gaps and really uh, discovering ways uh, to really stop those that are ignoring the war, uh, the law uh, and really um, enacting the penalties that are appropriate. Thank you again, Governor, for doing that. And I know that it, keeping the 14-day quarantine as we look at the trans-Pacific travel is going to be a, another topic of conversation. So I'm looking forward to how we kind of talk about that because I think what you have in place, the screenings that are going to happen, the contact tracing, I think that's also going to be very good policy that we have in place. I'm going to, I want you to brag about one more thing, Governor, because I know you are much, much too humble uh, and that you, people don't really acknowledge that the resolve that you have demonstrated in this crisis. So can you share with the public you know, what you did with Title 32 and the National Guard um, and how you stuck to that to your guns on that, despite what the White House wanted to do and how that not has only has benefited our state, but our nation? You know, certainly. And I, I do co-chair the Council on Governors, uh, which is a bipartisan group of governors, five Democrats and five Republicans appointed by the president uh, to be the interface between governors and states uh, and uh, the um, the federal administration, the president and his administration, and I think most importantly, the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, which obviously has big impact uh, here in Hawaii. Uh, Department of Homeland Security also houses the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. So clearly, especially during natural disasters, uh, that is just an important part. Uh, you know, and in my role as co-chair of the council, we have been working uh, in a very bipartisan way uh, to uh, strengthen uh, National Guard uh, and their support for, for civil activities, which, you know, as a governor and every single governor all across the country, we recognize how important that is. Uh, and most importantly, Uh, you know, taking the action to assure that even if the federal government is involved and is paying for some of it, that the governors and the states will always be in control and directing activity uh, of the National Guard uh, and even the military should they get involved. Uh, You know, the the current recent actions and the protests and uh, rioting and violence uh, is truly... uh, a concerning uh, situation, I think, that all of us governors deal with. Uh, and to think, uh, President, um, thinking that he can direct action to keep our community safe all across the country from uh, New York and what's happening in Queens and um, in all of those um, county complexes uh, to Washington, D.C., to Minnesota, to Seattle, to Portland, and to Honolulu, Uh, And even on Maui, um, you know, is a ridiculous uh, assumption that he can order the military to go in and fix things. You know, the governor's made it clear that that's just not uh, acceptable. And and most importantly, 
it really doesn't serve the public uh, in any way. You know, Title 32 allows the federal government to support um, our National Guard in responding to emergencies, but it uh, is premised on the notion that governors are still in charge. Uh, and I think that that's the best compromise and best serves our community. Uh, we made it very clear with the president that that is fundamental uh, and that um, none of us governors would ever give up the authority uh, regardless of what um, what the federal government can provide if we cannot direct the activities uh, of the National Guard or the Department of Defense as it impacts on an emergency. I really appreciate you taking that stand, Governor. I want to acknowledge a question that came up in our Facebook live stream. This is from Alan Smithy, who's asking, what is your plan to expedite addressing the remaining issues of unemployment insurance and food security as funds run out? You know, certainly uh, on a couple of uh, fronts, you know, I just uh, authorized the distribution to all the other counties. You know, I think it's been covered. Uh, City and County of Honolulu got CARES Act funds directly, uh, more than $300 million. Uh, none of the other counties, uh, Maui, Kauai, or Hawaii Island, uh, got resources from the CARES Act. So I just signed the transfer, and I know the legislature had uh, included that in the, um, their support uh, for uh, supporting the county. So I just signed over um, $175 million or so uh, to the counties. Um, and really, that is much-needed uh, funds that will help us uh, support uh, more food distribution, uh, help support with uh, mental health services to the homeless, uh, and other real critical safety net um, services that our community needs, especially in light of the fact that we are still having uh, some challenges with uh, distribution of unemployment benefits. So, Governor, we could probably go on for a lot longer, and this conversation has been super interesting, but I'm going to ask the last question, and, and please take your time to answer it. You know, beyond the physical changes that we're going to see and that we can expect in the post-COVID world, things like more social distancing, mask wearing, better hygiene practices, can we? Can you share with us how you think Hawaii will be different in the post-COVID world? Paint me a picture of what you believe Hawaii will look like um, AC after COVID in very specific areas that we might not have heard from you uh, talk about uh, recently. Uh, th uh, thanks uh, very much for that question, Della. I do think that this COVID pandemic uh, is a community changing event and clearly uh, Hawaii will not ever be the same uh, going forward. Uh, so just on a couple of quick things and I don't wanna get bogged down in, in all the details, but uh, you know, for the hospitality industry, I'm challenging them to reinvent themselves in this infectious disease uh, environment and really uh, help us educate uh, the travelers and visitors and guests coming here about what is uh, what it is uh, to be a good, respectful visitor. Uh, and that means being um, sensitive to our culture uh, and helping us celebrate our diversity. Uh, but now in this COVID, um, post-COVID environment, also that they need to help us uh, keep them healthy. So, you know, be connected to us. If they are getting sick, uh, we do want to support them uh, and we want to help them um, be here as a guest and, and help us uh, keep our community safe. So it's really creating a broad community network uh, to help uh, every guest and every resident uh, be safe in this uh, infectious disease environment. So, you know, we're working with everyone in the visitor indi industry to reinvent themselves in that context. Um, you know, a couple other things I think that will really be accelerated and help with the transformation of our economy. You know, Della, I could not imagine us being here and doing this, you know, streaming live on Olelo, uh, uh, having this conversation, uh, via video conference. You know, I'm, I'm the biggest uh, proponent of technology for all of my uh, 30 years plus in public service, but we've seen more acceleration of the embracing of technology. You know, the notion of, of, of meeting face-to-face, -face, but being separated. 
Uh, and I truly see, you know, it's helped us in the departments. You know, mm -hmm. our agencies have uh, embraced telework. You know, we've actually accelerated the, our drive to paperless. You know, and I know the legislature's been there forever, and you you don't know what it was like, uh, Della, before uh, we did everything paperlessly. But, uh, you know, I think you will see a tremendous acceleration of the transformation of state government. Uh, and uh, it'll allow us to be more responsive and more uh, efficient and effective on behalf of the people of Hawaii. I mean, I think that that's a, a real live tangible benefit. And, and finally, you know, we've talked about creating an economy for our children. Uh, I know that uh, for you uh, and for me, uh, parents with uh, kids, we want them to have the opportunity to, uh, to live in Hawaii and grow up, uh, be able to purchase a house or, or rent an apartment, uh, get an uh, exciting quality job, uh, and really enjoy all the benefits of being here in the islands. Uh, and I think that this COVID is really accelerating that opportunity. You know, my son is a software engineer for Microsoft, uh, and he's been working at home uh, since January 1st of this year. And Microsoft just informed him that he can continue to work at home uh, till the end of October. You know, and obviously, if we knew that uh, at the beginning, we could have told him to come home and he could have worked at, from Hawaii uh, just as well as he could work from where he lives in uh, Seattle. Uh, and so this COVID is making that opportunity real. Uh, and we should be able to do a whole lot more of that uh, going forward. Uh, so uh, just thank you so much for this opportunity. I really believe that Hawaii will be stronger and better. Our community will come together in a way that will allow us to create a better Hawaii going forward. Thank you so much, Governor, for joining us. And I'm very excited about all of those things that you've talked about. You can sign off now, continue watching Speaker Psyche and Me talk, but thank yes. you so much. Thank you.